Thank you, Ugo. <laughs> now, you have one thing in common with Walter Di Maria. He refused to explain his work. Uh, <laughs> and if you've ever read the statements that accompany the lightning field, they are simply factual, very much like what you did describing this exhibition. There I is mean, I don't refuse to explain. By uh, telling what it is, you explain everything about the work. That's one point of view. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I would like you to say something I, about the decision-making process in a complex piece such as this. Now, I assume you were responding to the spaces themselves. That was part of the inspiration for this ensemble of works. But um, how do you go from, uh, let's say, deciding to cast one uh, dancer in this medium of wax and earth to doing 14? Or how do, you do, how do you go from having cast 14 to placing three in a room versus one? or one in a room with a block of, of earth, of cast earth. I mean, the decisions involve interpretation on your part of what you're doing and what the implications of these objects will be. Can you say something about how that decision-making process proceeds? In, in, in this case, it was uh, bringing together five different groups of works that existed before in other exhibition. In the case of the 40 nudes, they were made for an for a exhibition in New York. And this, this specific rooms, room is very tall. And normally, uh, artists respond to this tall cube of a, of a space by placing one singular gigantic sculpture. And I wanted to bring uh, a human scale back to the room. And this was the initial idea to cast. The number 14 wa was, was without an intention, but what I wanted is to cast those, those people and they were and, um, in a passive situation. And before those nudes, I had previous castings, one group of seven fat clowns, also passive sitting. And in the 90s, I cast myself in, a, in sitting and lying passive position. So this was just a, an extended situation that had his origin in the 90s. What was important was that they were young, uh, meaning full of energy, and this was for me a contradiction to have them sitting there. Now, uh, critically speaking, um, body casting is the most conservative method of making sculpture that there is these days. <laughs> you know, it, it's a very, if you will, retrograde uh, technique. And now, you're under no obligation as an artist to do what is historically uh, edgy or, or forward-looking by any means, but it, it strikes me as a, a remarkably uh, verging on sentimentality to use this technique. And also, this appears to be a very moody installation. Uh, much of your work appears to me to be very moody. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you value emotional force over um, the formal aspects, the material aspects of what you produce? I didn't understand the question. The emotional force. Uh, the emotional is, force, yes, it's, it's, a, very it's a driving force. It's the driving force. It's a dri okay. also, I always say you don't have to understand my work, but you have to feel it. Does that mean that the emotional force is what carries you from one work to another? The work generates himself, yes. I mean, it has a base and whatever follows, is always a reaction of what, what came before, yes. Now, I want to open the floor to... I mean, I do have some restriction, like the, 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 the days of the year. I, I like uh, systems. Hmm. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> systems restrict, restrict me. Uh, for example, I did 
those previous, uh, uh, that I mentioned, those seven clowns, they were all named after the seven days of the week. And this kind of restriction helps you not to overboard. So it was seven days I would know that I would just make seven clowns, even if the demand was maybe for 20 clowns. <laughs> or by making this list of the fi 59 birds, I would know, okay, I restrict myself to those 59, even if the next day I would have come up with a, a different list. Now I want to open, the, we have, time is very short. I want to open the floor to questions here. So uh, anyone who is within reach of a microphone? Hi, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the element of humor in your work. Um, when I heard you describing the gallery, uh, I got a sense that you were playing with our expectations a little bit about how we categorize and label artworks and uh, subverting that to a degree. And I actually derived a little bit of humor from that. And I was wondering if that was intentional. I mean, intentional was that I would give just a very basic explanation or description of, of, the, of, the, of what was there to see. And, and all my symbols that I use are very universal or childlike. And the exhibition started with a very childlike sculpture of those childlike formed birds. They were done uh, in a daily basic. So I would make one bird a day and whatever came out, came out. And the exhibition ended with a childlike motif of those children drawings. So, so all my works are very basic that you don't ha even have to talk about because everybody can reflect themselves in. Yes, in the second row. Uh, the delivery of your description was a very powerful and very important part for us to experience this. And I was wondering if you would do that in the gallery space. How do you feel about you know, the, the words versus the visual? And, and would you ever include them at the same time? Uh, I would include or I had include words if they are visually uh, I, there's a group of outside sculptures that I'm doing. Those are rainbows. And the rainbow spells always a poem, a short poem, like Crimea River. Or the last one was uh, Breed, Walk, Die. I just did three weeks ago. So they are, I, I like words in that sense that they are really uh, descriptive in a way that they can stop me in front of it. But I guess what I'm asking is for us, or for me, you know, hearing the, the description was very much a very important part of this. And have you ever had a voiceover? Uh, Would you ever have a voiceover at the same time? It, it, it was another art piece, let's put it that way. What you did uh, just now was another art piece. I mean, last year I, uh, I did my first uh, artist talk, I always refuse to talk about my work. <laughs> and so I came with a solution that I, I felt comfortable with it. And uh, as you, it can be by part very boring because I re keep repeating things, but for me it's like a mantra. Yeah, so it was great. Thank you. I'd like to know how many people actually crawled under the wall to see the children's drawings in the uh, museum setting. I mean, for sure, all the children that helped me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and their parents. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, once you entered that space, it was very uncomfortable because the, the, the room has been stripped naked. And so either you many people wouldn't bother to go down and leave the space. I think that's all we have time for, right, Bill? I'm sorry we have to cut it off here because we have to keep the schedule no matter what. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Tim. Thank you.
I just I want to make one quick announcement before we all depart. Kenneth, thank you so much. Ugo, thank you so much. So glad you came. Um, a couple of things. You've heard uh, Yvonne Force Villarreal and um, uh, <laughs> Doreen Remen uh, and Art Production Fund mentioned a couple of times today because of major uh, works that they have produced, including Prada Marfa and also uh, a work by David Brooks in New York. And uh, we are fortunate that we have partnered with the Art Production Fund. Uh, Yvonne and Doreen are not here. They're actually receiving, I think last night, the Yoko Ono uh, Peace Prize in Iceland. So, yes. <laughs> so they really wanted to be here, but of course, what a priority and what a, what a, what a fantastic uh, award for them to receive. So, uh, but I'm bringing them up right now because uh, they're good friends of the museum. And about three years ago, uh, we began talking about forming a partnership, the Nevada Museum of Art and Art Production Fund, uh, to help Ugo realize a new large-scale artwork that will be sited on Bureau of Land Management land uh, just south of Las Vegas near the Gene Dry Lake. And I'm not going to tell you much more about that piece because we don't want to jinx it. Uh, we are raising a lot of money. Uh, we are dealing with uh, very complicated application and permitting processes, not only with BLM, but with the Clark County uh, commissioners uh, down there. But we do have uh, Aria uh, Resort with us as a major sponsor and some others. So we're not going to say too much about it. But if you saw Human Nature in Rockefeller Center last summer, uh, it'll give you some indication uh, of something to come. Uh, very different, uh, but we're really excited and very privileged, Ugo, to be working with you on this. And the idea is that we will uh, hopefully launch this uh, in mid-2015. So stay tuned. And uh, we have a party on the roof. We have food. We have wine. We have rum. We have all sorts of neat stuff up there. So let's go up there and continue the conversation. Have a great night. Thank you.